since we had entered the territory we had not seen a hostile Indian, and we had, therefore, become careless in the extreme, and were wont to ridicule the stories we had heard of the great numbers of these vicious marauders, that were supposed to haunt the trails, taking their toll in lives and torture of every white party, which fell into their merciless clutches. Powell, I knew, was well armed and, further, an experienced Indian fighter, but I too had lived and fought for years among the Sioux in the north, and I knew that his chances were small against a party of cunning trailing Apaches. Finally I could endure the suspense no longer, and, arming myself with my two Colt revolvers and a carbine, I strapped two belts of cartridges about me and catching my saddle horse, started down the trail taken by Powell in the morning. As soon as I reached comparatively level ground I urged my mount into a canter and continued this, where the going permitted, until, close upon dusk, I discovered the point where other tracks joined those of Powell. They were the tracks of unshot ponies, three of them, and the ponies had been galloping. I followed rapidly until, darkness shutting down, I was forced to await the rising of the moon, and given an opportunity to speculate on the question of the wisdom of my chase. Possibly I had conjured up impossible dangers, like some nervous old housewife, and when I should catch up with Powell would get a good laugh for my pains. However, I am not prone to sensitiveness, and the following of a sense of duty, wherever it may lead, has always been a kind of fanatic with me throughout my life, which may account for the honors bestowed upon me by three republics and the decorations and friendships of an old and powerful emperor and several lesser kings, and whose service my sword has been read many a time. About nine o'clock the moon was sufficiently bright for me to proceed on my way and I had no difficulty in following the trail at a fast walk and in some places at a brisk trot until, about midnight, I reached the water hole, where Powell had expected to camp. I came upon this spot unexpectedly, finding it entirely deserted, with no signs of having been recently occupied as a camp. I was interested to note that the tracks of the pursuing horsemen, for such I was now convinced they must be, continued after Powell with only a brief stop at the hole for water, and always at the same rate of speed as his. I was positive now that the trailers were Apaches, and that they wished to capture Powell alive for the fiendish pleasure of the torture, so I urged my horse onward at a most dangerous pace, hoping against hope, that I would catch up with the red rascals before they attacked him speculation was suddenly cut short by the faint report of two shots far ahead of me. I knew that Powell would need me now if ever, and I instantly urged my horse to his topmost speed up a narrow and difficult mountain trail. I had forged the head for perhaps a mile or more without hearing further sounds, when the trail suddenly debouched onto a small, open plateau near the summit of the pass. I had passed through a narrow, overhanging gorge just before entering suddenly upon this table land, and the sight which met my eyes filled me with consternation and dismay. The little stretch of level land was white with Indian teepees, and there were probably half a thousand red warriors clustered around some object near the center of the camp. Their attention was so wholly riveted to this point of interest, that they did not notice me and I easily could have turned back into the dark recesses of the gorge, and made my escape with perfect safety. The fact, however, that this thought did not occur to me until the following day removes any possible right to a claim to heroism, to which the narration of this episode might possibly otherwise and I do not believe that I am made of the stuff which constitutes heroes, because, in all of the hundreds of instances, that my voluntary acts have placed me face to face with death, I cannot recall a single one, where any alternative step to, that I took occurred to me until many hours later. 
my mind is evidently so constituted that I am subconsciously forced into the path of duty without recourse to tiresome mental processes. However that may be, I have never regretted that cowardice is not optional with me. In this instance I was, of course, positive that Powell was the center of attraction, but whether I thought, or acted first I do not know, but within an instant from the moment the scene broke upon my view I had whipped out my revolvers, and was charging down upon the entire army of warriors, shooting rapidly, and whooping at the top of my lungs. Single-handed, I could not have pursued better tactics, for the red men, convinced by sudden surprise, that not less than a regiment of regulars was upon them, turned and fled in every direction for their bows, arrows, and rifles. The view which their hurried routing disclosed filled me with apprehension and with rage. Under the clear rays of the Arizona moon lay Powell, his body fairly bristling with the hostile arrows of the braves. That he was already dead I could not but be convinced, and yet I would have saved his body from mutilation at the hands of the Apaches, as quickly as I would have saved the man himself from death. Riding close to him I reached down from the saddle, and grasping his cartridge belt drew him up across the withers of my mouth. A backward glance convinced me that to return by the way I had come would be more hazardous than to continue across the plateau, so, putting spurs to my poor beast, I made a dash for the opening to the pass, which I could distinguish on the far side of the table land. The Indians had by this time discovered that I was alone and I was pursued with the imprecations, arrows, and rifle balls. The fact, that it is difficult to aim anything but imprecations accurately by moonlight, that they were upset by the sudden and unexpected manner of my advent, and that I was a rather rapidly moving target saved me from the various deadly projectiles of the enemy, and permitted me to reach the shadows of the surrounding peaks, before an orderly pursuit could be organized. My horse was traveling practically unguided, as I knew that I had probably less knowledge of the exact location of the trail to the pass than he, and thus it happened that he entered a defile, which led to the summit of the range and not to the pass, which I had hoped would carry me to the valley and to safety. It is probable, however, that to this fact I owe my life in the remarkable experiences and adventures, which befell me during the following ten years. My first knowledge, that I was on the wrong trail came, when I heard the yells of the pursuing savages suddenly grow fainter and fainter far off to my left. I knew then that they had passed to the left of the jag rock formation at the edge of the plateau, to the right of which my horse had borne me in the body of Powell. I drew rein on a little level promontory overlooking the trail below and to my left and saw the party of pursuing savages disappearing around the point of a neighboring peak. I knew the Indians would soon discover that they were on the wrong trail, and that the search for me would be renewed in the right direction as soon as they located my tracks. I had gone but a short distance further when, what seemed to be an excellent trail opened up around the face of a high cliff. The trail was level and quite broad and led upward, and in the general direction I wished to go. The cliff arose for several hundred feet on my right, and on my left was an equal and nearly perpendicular drop to the bottom of a rocky ravine. I had followed this trail for perhaps a hundred yards, when a sharp turn to the right brought me to the mouth of a large cave. The opening was about four feet in height and three to four feet wide, and at this opening the trail ended, it was now morning, and, with the customary lack of dawn, which is a startling characteristic of Arizona, it had become daylight almost without warning. Dismounting, I laid Powell upon the ground, but the most painstaking examination failed to reveal the faintest spark of life. I forced water from my canteen between his dead lips, 
Bayless face and rubbed his hands, working over him continuously for the better part of an hour in the face of the fact that I knew him to be dead. I was very fond of Powell, he was thoroughly a man in every respect, a Polish southern gentleman, a staunch and true friend, and it was with a feeling of the deepest grief that I finally gave up my crude endeavors at resuscitation. Leaving Powell's body where it lay on the ledge I crept into the cave to reconnoiter. I found a large chamber, possibly a hundred feet in diameter and thirty or forty feet in height, a smooth and well-worn floor, and many other evidences that the cave had, at some remote period, been inhabited. The back of the cave was so lost in dense shadow, that I could not distinguish whether there were openings into other apartments or not. As I was continuing my examination I commenced to feel a pleasant drowsiness creeping over me, which I attributed to the fatigue of my long and strenuous ride, and the reaction from the excitement of the fight and the pursuit. I felt comparatively safe in my present location, as I knew that one man could defend the trail to the cave against an army. I soon became so drowsy, that I could scarcely resist the strong desire, to throw myself on the floor of the cave for a few moments rest, but I knew that this would never do, as it would mean certain death at the hands of my red friends, who might be upon me at any moment. With an effort I started toward the opening of the cave only, to reel drunkenly against a side wall, and from there slip thrown upon the floor, 